Craig, uh, how many of you have this handout still in your Bible? You don't have it? I didn't bring it today. Nobody has it? Do you got it, Joe? If you got it, pull it out. It says, We feign not having mercy for ministry. You got it there? I think enough people have some copies. I might have bring them today. But uh, we're going to be going over that weapon in, in your Bible today. And um, somebody say, well, why do you call them weapons? And I go, because that's what Paul calls them. <laughs> Why call it what Scripture says? Well, I, can't, I don't have an answer for that to you. You know, uh, you know what Paul says. We started this out. We've taken a, a, a kind of a vacation from it for a little bit, uh, just because we had some different kind of meetings going on. And um, uh, last week we were at Carol's, my mom's, where she offered the house up for us. That was real nice. And because uh, they had the graduation here at school, so we couldn't meet. That happens once a year. So I want to thank her. And um, Paul says this um, in terms of his ministry. Um, now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the mer- by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. I'm in 2 Corinthians 10.1. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And those strongholds in the next verse, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and have, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do ye look on the things after the outward appearance. If any man's... Any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ's. Paul says, think it through again, okay? And this time use the scriptures, right, that you were taught. Now, Paul, we said that Paul uses a, a, a digression here, a parenthesis. Um, a lot of times in the circles that we're in, uh, we have friends in the ministry that take a stand for God's grace. Um, they'll go to Ephesians 6 when it's about, you know, when they think of the weapons of our warfare. But quite frankly, what Paul wants them to put on for ministry's sake is the weapons available to do to us to do just what it says in verse 5. To cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So what we've done is we went back to the first chapter. And it's very obvious and very evident that the doctrine is one of those weapons. You know how it is people go into situations? They'll go to a, a person that's sick in the hospital. They'll go to a terminally ill person that's in the hospital. They'll go to, you know, a person that uh, is on their deathbed. Uh, they'll go to people with problems. They'll go suffering in the sufferings of this life. They'll go to believers that are going through things. What's the thing that Paul tells Timothy? The servant of the Lord must be what? Must not strive, but be what? Apt to teach. Uh, what are the elders to do? What do they do? Labor in the... Uh, it says doctrine, doesn't it? They labor in the doctrine. Why? Because comfort is provided in the doctrine. The doctrine's the answer. The teaching of who we are in Christ is the answer. You bring the doctrine to all these situations in life. And you ought to be apt to do it. Meaning... That's what should come to mind. Not a bunch of silly talk. Not the world's silly talk. Right? 
Is that what people need? Does that bring comfort? Silly talk? Talk without knowledge? Talk that's fil filled with the imaginations of man? Right? Things that talk about things that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God in Christ? Things that are just loose and flying all over the place because there's no obedience in Christ? You don't know how to exercise your faith, right, towards godliness, like-mindedness with Him? Then we looked at what? Forgiveness for ministry. Forgiveness for ministry. Uh, what did we used to have on our sign out there? The preaching, the preaching of the cross for the forgiveness of sin. Something purchased by the cross work of our Savior. It was purchased there for us. And in the local ministry, what do you have to have operating amongst the saints? Forgive others as Christ hath. Do you know the passages? Two. Ephesians 4.32 and Colossians 3.13. Just one of some. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Tender-hearted, tender responsive, not condemning, not marking somebody's steps, looking to jump down, jump on their bones, right? But responsive to what? Repentance. If you did something wrong, if there truly is something wrong, then what do you do? You're tender-hearted, responsive to repentance. Repentance to what? Putting off the old man and putting on the new. We're probably talking about conduct here. Some might think something is sin, but you've got to prove it from the Scriptures. It needs to be proved by the accuser and the what? Accused. Right? Not just a bunch of silly talk. Look at Colossians 3.13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. I'm sorry, 3.13. For bearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, you got a quarrel? Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Right? Any kind of quarrel. Is this basic in the ministry? Can saints operate without this weapon? And we studied a whole chapter about it, didn't we? What happens when you take up a flesh, fleshly carnal weaponry and use it instead. What would be the opposite of forgiveness? Cursing? Condemnation? You know, blackball? I hate you from this point. I always will hate you and I'll always try to get you. And I'll always try to get you. That's the opposite. Who do you give place to when you operate with a carnal weapon and not a spiritual weapon. It says you give place to the devil to operate in the local assembly if you're part of it. Right? Number three. What's another weapon? Our glorious message for ministry. When it says, Paul says, we plainly speak. What's he talking about? Do you remember all that? Moses, what did he do? Covered up the flesh. To hide what? The fading, vanishing glory of that program. The law program. He covered it up. Does, do we put covers over the glory of our message? Nope. In fact, when we face a mirror, we look to be transformed from glory to glory. There's no diminishing in our message. We speak it plainly. There's no secret about it. It's not going to fade or diminish or be replaced by anything.
by any message from the Lord. It's a glorious message. It's powerful. And it's a weapon amongst us, isn't it? It's a weapon. There's, there's no fading in it. There's no failure in it in our position in Christ. Did He fail us at all? On the cross at Calvary and what He provided for us, past, present, future? Nope. What's the third? The fourth message. Ah, fourth message. Fourth weapon. The inner man. Um, do you get that when you get saved? You have an inner man. But what does the inner man meet, need to be stored up with, have stored up in it? Sound this stuff here, this doctrine. So, in order to have this as a weapon for ministry, what do you got to do? Equip yourself. Equip yourself. Okay? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. We've come down to this point. In chapter 4, concerning this weapon for ministry that we... Do you remember what it, the purpose is? Why do you need strength in the inner man? Why do you need to be, your, have your conscience, your mind and heart fortified with sound doctrine? What will happen in the ministry if you do not? It says right there, Craig said it. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Inner man for ministry. What's the mercy? What he would put in your inner man. Which is what? The doctrine. Our glorious message that doesn't fade. In fact, it transforms us into His glory, does it not? Spirit, soul, and yet body. Right? Inner man. If you don't have this, what's going to happen when you get involved with the ministry? It says you'll faint. Notice verse 16. For, for which cause we faint not. Okay, in between there is the mercy. Right? The mercy in verse 1, we don't faint in verse 16. The mercy is in between in the chapter elucidated in between. Never make it in the ministry. That's why what, what's required of a steward of leadership in the local church? They be faithful. Right? To what? The meat that's been apportioned, the doctrine that's been apportioned for the mercy that's been apportioned to the church, the body of Christ. And to do what with the saints in the work of the ministry? Build them up so that they can function. Because without this weapon, you can't function. Do we put young saints in charge of things? Do we put ill-equipped saints in charge of things? Do we put saints that walk, their walk doesn't measure up to their talk in positions of leadership in the ministry? We do not. Why? They'll faint. They'll fall apart. They won't make it. They'll take you down. You need to be strong in the doctrine. Strong in His grace. You need to be strong down in the inner man. Because adversity is coming. Romans chapter 8. Right? I reckon that uh, of this present time. Paul brings this up. We studied the first chapter. What did Paul do in the first chapter? At Ephesus, what happened to him? He said he had the sentence of death on him and that he despaired of what? 
He's totally perplexed and confused, and he despaired of life. How was he saved? Second Corinthians 1, verse 10. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Was Paul going to come to further revelation at this time in his ministry? Yeah, he was. And what delivered him? The doctrine in there. The, the glorious, incredible power of our message to both the unsaved and the saved. Okay. Why was why does forgiveness start here? I mean, you get involved with the doctrine, what do you find out? Preaching of the cross for the What does the local assembly need in order to even stay together? Cuz we're all what? We all got, well, we're saved sinners, but we all got problems, we're all at different levels. We all take deeper plunges. <laughs> You know, some of the greatest men of faith in the Bible took the deepest plunges into sin. Solomon started out good. How did he finish? Worshipping Ashtoreth, the god of Easter. How about Abraham? When he went down to Egypt, do you remember what happened? I mean, it goes on and on. How about Daniel? Nebuchadnezzar worshipped him. What did Daniel do? Burned incense to him. Because he interpreted the dream. And what did Daniel do? Did he do what Paul did? Did he rip his clothes off and throw dirt on himself? No, he went, okay. I mean, it goes, we can go through... I mean, think of some more. You got some more? Moses? He struck the rock, what? Two times. Right? Samson, what'd he do? He broke his vow, didn't he? Cut his hair, broke his vow. Broke his vow, got involved with that woman, right? I mean, there isn't a man of God in the Bible that doesn't have a fall. Oh, what do they need? What did every one of them need? They needed the cross. And the cross provides what? Forgiveness. Our possession. He paid the price for sin. It's not capricious, is it? It's not willy-nilly. Like if I ask hard enough, okay, I forgive you. Is that how it works? You know, the fervency, the intensity of your prayer, is that how it works? No. He purchased it for us on the cross of Calvary. And we have it as a possession. And we're to deal with others as he dealt with us. Does that sound fair? Let's put it this way. That's a bad word. Does that sound just? If he forgave you, why wouldn't you forgive another? Unless you're what? You're exalting some things more highly than you ought you are placing yourself above that which is, you know the verse? Written. You think of yourself more highly than that which is written. We've come to a point now where the saint needs to get serious and equip themselves in the inner man. Because there's some things coming in the ministry. If you look at, again, if you look at verse 8, we are troubled on every side. Now, if you have your hand out, okay, I gave mine to Bill. That's okay. I know it. That's okay. No, I don't need it. But, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, okay? The treasure house of verse 7, the valuables that are now plain and plainly manifested and plainly seen and understood, by the manifestation of the truth, God's gifts to us. Assets that advantage us 
as we've seen in the first three chapters of 2 Corinthians, in this present evil world, in vessels of clay, literally. We're just silicates. We're just made out of modeling clay by the potter, the most high God of heaven and earth, divinely organized. I mean, without being a doctor, you've got some amazing knowledge about that. What happens if your circulatory system isn't working properly? You're going to die. Why? Because the blood feeds all the systems in your body. The systems start falling, and you get all these multiple things happening, right? But what's the bottom line? The blood. The blood moving around the body, feeding the systems that make you up. And quite frankly, who you are in the flesh is irrelevant. But your eternal perspective, that is not irrelevant. Who you are in the inner man, that is not irrelevant. <laughs> but who you are in the flesh is the least significant thing. It certainly is not our focus. And it's nonsense to make a big talk about it. Just nonsense. It really is. You can't hold on to it. You can't keep it together. And you can't keep the blood flowing. Well, I kept the blood flowing longer than you did. Bully for you. You know? <gasps> Bully for you. You think you look that good in the flesh? If you do, you know it's a trouble. Do you know that? If you look too good in the flesh, is it trouble? Are you going to be tempted more so if you look too good in the flesh? I like nice and ugly people in the flesh. I really enjoy them. I enjoy them. Most of us are pretty doggone ugly in all our... I mean, it's a bigger picture than the, our appearance. It's our expressions, our countenance. You know, it's all of that. But what's beautiful? Who we are where? How's a Christian woman to look? What's Paul say to the congregation? First Timothy. Verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel and shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with what? What's beautiful in the Lord? Good works. Not what you look like or who you are in the flesh. Do you realize you could have been born in horrendous situations? I've spent all week with someone that just, you know, Retarded epilepsy, just falling apart physically, you know, uh, hard to be around. Well, if she is, and she was born that way, well, who are you? What do you think? You're better than them? You're advantaged? You think God was unfair, unjust? No. Who you are in the flesh is not what? Relevant. What's relevant? It's not nothing, but it's not relevant. What's relevant? Who you are here in every way, shape, and form. Um, we're left here on earth in vessels and learn that we cannot conduct the true ministry in our own strength and performance. High-performance people in this life are not what's required for ministry. I was involved, I've been involved with some ministries, and boy, when high-performance people came along, whoa, that's great, let's exalt them into a position of power and leadership. Turned out bad every time. Because what's required? That steward be found what? Does that have anything to do with performance, faithful? I mean anything. Does it have anything to do with performance? Faithful. Fishermen? The most high God of heaven and earth incarnate 
walking on the surface of the earth, fishermen? What, what, what does the hierarchy of Israel call, the high performers, what do they call those fishermen? Ignorant. You ignorant and unlearned men. Does the Lord have his priorities right? The question is, do we? That's the question. Only by the great power of God's grace can we manifest truth by word and deed. This glorious message right here. 2 Corinthians, look at verse 8. Look at 7 and 8. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. Verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God in what? Okay, so what does that mean? It means that we conduct the ministry here, in the land of the living, in the flesh. Why does God do it that way? When I was a younger believer, I thought, why don't you just take me out of here now? I'm a mess. I want out of here. Sin in me and around me. I want out of here. Why doesn't he do that? So the flesh doesn't get the glory. So that the power and the excellency of that power might be of him and not us because of the flesh. Notice in verse 8, trouble, trouble breaks our trust in the flesh. He leaves us here in the flesh and trouble breaks our trust in the flesh as we grow. We build up the inner man in Christ. Notice he says we are troubled where? <laughs> Not just going the way you know the way you plan to go this way. <laughs> but while you're going this way, look what's happening over here. Look what's happening over here. And oh, somebody's coming after me back there. Every side trouble. Now remember, we're talking about ministry. It's not just a personal application here. We're talking about ministry, what we do together every Sunday. Trouble works hope in us in Romans chapter 5. I won't turn there again. And makes us not ashamed of the outward circumstances because of the love of God that's shed abroad down here in our hearts. Not compartmentalized in departments, you know, where you got world in this department and you got Christ in this department. <laughs> Right? But a house that's all what? All the rooms are lit by God the Holy Spirit leading us through the truth. All the rooms of our heart are lit by the Holy Ghost. And that means understanding. Uh, Ghostbusters. Do you believe in ghosts? Remember that? Do you believe in ghosts? Holy Spirit has two names. What are they? Why do you think that is? Why do you think the Holy Spirit has two names? Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Because you can't see them. Can you? Where's the whole idea of ghosts come from? Holy Ghost. Why would it be Holy Spirit? Because you can't see the Holy Spirit. In their program, could you see the Holy Spirit? No, but you could see that it occupied the saint in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost, couldn't you? Can you see the Spirit occupying us the moment we believe? Holy Ghost. Does Paul use the terminology Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit? We don't walk by sight when that's at issue in the text. There you go. And this is how you, you, you try to see how God thinks by the words that he uses and the context he uses them in. And you're, you're in the mind of God. You're in the mind of Christ that way. Because we are not going to interpret things from the outside in. We're going to interpret things from the inside out. I've read this prayer. I've read this a thousand times. I'll read the whole thing this time. Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are. Is the word of God, not else is worth believing. Now there's two more stanzas. Though my heart should feel condemned for want of some sweet token, there is one greater than my heart whose word cannot be broken. I'll trust in God's unchanging word till soul and body sever. For though all things shall pass away, his word shall stand forever. 
know, the sentiment of those stanzas is this. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Very pure. See the adjective there? Therefore thy servant loveth it. Do you see what Martin Luther is writing about? He is not going to interpret things from what? The outside in. He's not. And he suffered for the things that he stood for. They hunted him. They wanted to kill him. Just like a dog they hunted him. You stand up against the power of Satan's church. How dare you? He got off a translation of the Bible in German. How about that? In Romans 8, the same great love displayed at Calvary secures us. The issue there is security. In all the sufferings of this present time, with hope, help, the help of the God, the Holy Spirit, despite anything that would occur, uh, anything that would oppose, accuse, condemn, or separate us from the love of Christ in our minds. The mercy for ministry in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the treasures visible and available for our trust, turn outward inversity endured into God's good. Now, if you look at the list here, and if you, some of you that have that handout, take a look at the, at the similarity. If you don't, get Romans 8 and flip back and forth. There are seven things in Romans 8. Seven things that we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. How about that? One is security despite the circumstances. One is enduring ministry despite the circumstances. How about that? You see what they are? The seven things in Romans 8, if you look at verse 35, Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Turn over to 2 Corinthians 4. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Cast down, that would be famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Cast down by those things. What's in 2 Corinthians 4 that is not in Romans 8? While you're thinking about that, not only can't they separate you, they, in fact, are fodder that employ spiritual weaponry that makes us more than conquerors, more than just reigning over, more than just ruling over. More than conquerors has to do with the sufferings of this present time. What does God do with them? He makes them into good, his good. He takes them and he makes them good where? Though our outward man, we're not there yet, perisheth, the inner man is renewed what? We're more than conquerors. The very trouble. Here we are. We're left here and we have all this trouble, especially when you get involved with the ministry, right? All this trouble that it is to try and equip folks with the truth. A lot of trouble. We could take that trouble and we turn it around and all it does is build this up. That's being more than a conqueror, isn't it? Of this place, of the land of the living, where we walk in the flesh. Sufferings advantage us. Sufferings advantage the Lord and His glory in us. You know, Second Corinthians chapter 3, what do we change from? Glory to glory. Is, was Israel changed from glory to glory as they steadfastly looked upon Moses? No, in fact, what did he do? Not only weren't they changed to glory, he put the veil over his face. Why? Because the glory diminished on his face. It's not the case with our message. 
And that glory is who we are here for ministry. What's the thing that isn't there? Perplexed is not in the list over in Romans 8. Perplexed. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, uh, here we see the working of the same of Romans 8, producing mercy for ministry and not just security in us as more than conquerors. The extra trouble, perplexed, that would cause us to quit. Okay. What's perplexed mean? Confused. In a quandary. What to think? What to do? What now? This book starts out with Paul in that situation, does it not? At Ephesus, right? When he had the sense of death on himself, what did he want to do? Quit. Quit. He was totally perplexed as to what to do in the labor of the ministry. Decisions in the ministry. What's most expedient in the Lord unto His glory? Unto His glory, not ours. Ministry at moments can be very confusing. Yet upon reflection, we realize circumstances are not at issue. But our warrant is the will of God. The will of God. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. What do you do when you get in this state? What do you do when you get in this state? By the way, what does it say? Perplexed but not in. Was Paul in despair in chapter 1? Yeah, there's a time, there was a period of time there where he was in despair. He's perplexed. He was confused. He wanted to quit. And you notice over here in Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God. Um, confused. Would peace almost be an antonym to confused and perplexed? Yeah, I'm at peace inside myself. I'm not, <laughs> right? In everything, he says, and the peace of God which path this understanding. We just don't know what's behind what's happening. A lot, do we? We find out later sometimes shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Keep what? Your soul and your spirit. That makes up what? The inner man is made up of the spirit and the soul. Without the treasure house and the inner man, no peace. Rather despair, quit, deny. Or let's say this, quit doing the real ministry. Let's play church. Let's play ministry. Let's play games. Let's teach that the law produces righteousness and affirm that it will. Games. Because when you start to, when you abandon this weapon right here, this glorious message, and you put a veil over your face, right, and start teaching the law, what happens? Are you going to produce the glory of Christ in the minds and hearts of the saints? Not at all. Um, look at 2 Corinthians 10 here. 2 Corinthians 10. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10. Always. Do you see that word always? Not sometimes. Not come to church and leave. Not open your Bible every once in a while when some form of anxiety has taken place. But notice here, always, always, we always bear about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. What's that a reference to? Then it says that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. What's that a reference to? Always. 
Look at Romans 6. It's this. Verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His what? What are we bearing about all the time? That baptism, that death, what death is it? Death to our members. Death to our members. Not what they want, but what we tell them to do, our members. What we command them by our mind and habitualize in our hearts the way we move around and what we do and say and what our conduct is when we move around. That death baptism is something we always bear about. We've been identified with his death. We are buried with him by baptism into death. It's a spiritual baptism, isn't it? Body, soul. And in our, in, I mean spirit, soul, and in our spirit and our soul, what are we to do with the body? That chain right there, when the body pulled on it, told you what to do, it's been cut by God. And now what do you do? You tell it what to do. And when to do it. Always. Not only that, but as you read on, therefore we are, bapt- we are buried with him by baptism into death. What should you think of your flesh as? I mean, if you're spirit and soul, that's who you are in the inner man. What should you think of your body? It's not just dead. What do you do when somebody dies? You bury it. When you bury something, do you see it anymore? Do you hear it anymore? Do you feel it anymore? I'll just go to three senses, right? You don't. No more. No more is that thing we say had that expression, yanking your chain. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life. It's a spiritual baptism. It's spiritual. That, that carnal mind, see, is buried. And we're being transformed here in the inner man. We're baptized into his resurrection life by the doctrine, by the teaching. The words of the Lord are spirit and they are life, it says in John 6:63. 6, we're baptized into his resurrection also. That we should walk anew in resurrection of life. Okay, I want to wind up on this right here. Take a look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. You know the funny thing in 1 Corinthians 15? Here the saints there are denying the, res- the bodily resurrection. And, and besides, where did that come from, the idea that, that, that there's no resurrection of the dead? Sad, you see. And who was next door? To Justice's house where the Corinthians met. Synagogue. Where do you think that idea come from? How do you think that was going on in the assembly at Corinth? That there's no resurrection of the dead. You know, they're talking about the resurrection of the body. And here we just read about the spiritual resurrection in the inner man. What's not been resurrected yet? The body. Why? So he might temper the inner man. How are you going to use that body? Are you going to use it for him? Or are you going to use it for yourself? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. Folks have trouble with this passage, but really it's very simple. If you compare Scripture with Scripture. He says, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If you've been identified spiritually and died and been buried, what if there isn't any resurrection of the dead? Then when you believe, you just died early, didn't you? And there you are in your unenlightened spirit, in your alienated heart. 
You are dead in trespasses and sins. We're not even talking about the body yet. In other words, why would God identify you with his death? To bring you into what? A baptism into what? His resurrection life. Spirit, soul, body. That's why Paul's asking the question, what, are you crazy? Else what they, shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized? For, why did God baptize you for the dead then? If he also didn't baptize you into what? His resurrection unto life. Then verse 30. And why stand we in jeopardy every day? Why are we in jeopardy every day if we're just dead? I mean, dead people, are they a threat? Why do we stand in jeopardy every day? Why were we buried with him if not to be raised? Why? What purpose of God was there here? Our baptism, and we'll stop here today, Romans 6. You know, the, the, the individual that says, shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? The answer to that is our baptism. As if, as if to say, I'm, st I'm, I'm dead, but I'm still walking around. Like the uh, living dead, I don't know the name of those horror things, right? You notice all those movies have corruptible walking around, that which is corrupt. Walking around, worm food, falling apart, right? Hideous, awful. That's even wishful thinking, isn't it? When was the last time you met a zombie? Or vampire? Look how much time we spend on that in our culture. Knowing this, well, verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing that, this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from... What did that death baptism do, that spiritual baptism accomplish? It freed us from what? Sin, it circumcised us. What was that? It was a casting away of the flesh. You cast it away. You're henceforth not going to live anymore for it. But rather to the one that, what? Died for your sin. We're completely identified with his cross work for serving him in his resurrection life. Father, we're so thankful this morning for these weapons that allow us to equip one another for the trouble, for the trouble in our lives. Uh, equipped, and we're thankful, Father, that, that, that you've, you've uh, gifted us so that we can take trouble and make it work for your glory and be strengthened in the inner man who we really are and one day wear a body that's fashioned like unto his glorious body in the heavenly places. Uh, we, we thank you for that great hope and we thank you for uh, the land of the living in the flesh and that we might labor here for your glory. In his name we pray, amen.